Chapter Four of The World Set Free by H. G. Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marsitich. June 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. The World Set Free by H. G. Wells. Chapter the Fourth. THE NEW PHASE SECTION 1 The task that lay before the assembly of Brissago, viewed as we may view it now from the clarifying standpoint of things accomplished, was in its broad issues a simple one. Essentially, it was to place social organization upon the new footing that the swift, accelerated advance of human knowledge had rendered necessary. The council was gathered together, with the haste of a salvage expedition, and it was confronted with wreckage, but the wreckage was irreparable wreckage, and the only possibilities of the case were either the relapse of mankind to the agricultural barbarism from which it had emerged so painfully, or the acceptance of achieved science as the basis of a new social order. The old tendencies of human nature, suspicion, jealousy, particularism and belligerency were incompatible with the monstrous destructive power of the new appliances of the inhuman logic of science had produced the equilibrium could be restored only by civilization destroying itself down to a level at which modern apparatus could no longer be produced or by human nature adapting itself in its institutions to the new conditions it was for the latter alternative that the assembly existed. Sooner or later, this choice would have confronted mankind. The sudden development of atomic science did but precipitate and render rapid a dramatic clash between the new and the customary that had been gathering since ever the first flint was chipped or the first fire built together. From the day when man contrived himself a tool and suffered another male to draw near him, he ceased to be altogether a thing of instinct and untroubled convictions. From that day forth, a widening breach can be traced between his egotistical passions and the social need. Slowly he adapted himself to the life of the homestead, and his passionate impulses widened out to the demands of the clan and the tribe. But widened though his impulses might, the latent hunter and wanderer and wanderer in his imagination outstripped their development. He was never quite subdued to the soil, nor quite tamed to the home. Everywhere it needed teaching and the priest to keep him within the bounds of the plough life and the beast tending. Slowly a vast system of traditional imperatives superposed itself upon his instincts, imperatives that were admirably fitted to make him that cultivator that cattle mincer who was for twice ten thousand years the normal man and unpremeditated undesired out of the accumulations of his tilling came civilization civilization was the agricultural surplus it appeared as trade and tracks and roads it pushed boats out upon the rivers, and presently invaded the seas. And within its primitive courts, within temples grown rich and leisurely, amidst the gathering medley of the seaport towns, rose speculation and philosophy and science, and the beginning of the new order that has at last established itself as human life. Slowly at first, as we traced it, and then with an accumulating velocity, the new powers were fabricated. Man as a whole did not seek them nor desire them. They were thrust into his hand. For a time, men took up and used these new things, and the new powers inadvertently as they came to him, wrecking nothing of the consequences. For endless generations, change led him very gently. But when he had been led far enough, change quickened the pace. It was with a series of shocks that he realized at last 
that he was living the old life less and less, and a new life more and more. Already before the release of atomic energy, the tensions between the old way of living and the new were intense. They were far intenser than they had been even at the collapse of the Roman imperial system. On the one hand was the ancient life of the family and the small community and the petty industry, and on the other was a new life on a larger scale, with remoter horizons and a strange sense of purpose. Already it was growing clear that men must live on one side or the other. One could not have had little tradespeople and syndicated businesses in the same market, sleeping carters and motor trolleys on the same road, bows and arrows and airplane sharpshooters in the same army, or illiterate peasant industries and power-driven factories in the same world. And still less, it was possible that one could have the ideas and ambitions and greed and jealousy of peasants equipped with the vast appliances of the new age. If there had been no atomic bombs to bring together most of the directing intelligence of the world to that hasty conference at Brasago, there would have still been, extended over great areas, and a considerable space of time perhaps, a less formal conference of responsible and understanding people upon the perplexities of this worldwide opposition. If the work of Holston had been spread over centuries and imparted to the world by imperceptible degrees, it would nevertheless have made it necessary for men to take counsel upon and set a plan for the future. Indeed already, there had been accumulating for a hundred years before the crisis a literature of foresight. There was a whole mass of modern state scheming available for the conference to go upon. These bombs did but accentuate and dramatize an already developing problem. Section 2 this assembly was no leap of exceptional minds and superintelligence into the control of affairs. It was teachable. Its members trailed ideas with them to the gathering. But these were the consequences of the moral shock the bombs had given humanity. And there is no reason for supposing its individual personalities were greatly above the average. It would be possible to cite a thousand instances of error and inefficiency in its proceedings due to the forgetfulness, irritability, or fatigue of its members. It experimented considerably and blundered often. Excepting Holston, whose gift was highly specialized, it is questionable whether there was a single man of the first order of human quality in the gathering but it had a modest fear of itself, and a consequent directness that gave it a general distinction. There was, of course, a noble simplicity about Leblanc, but even of him it may be asked whether he was not rather good and honest-minded than in the fuller sense great. The ex-king had wisdom and a certain romantic dash. He was a man among thousands even if he was not a man among millions. But his memoirs, and indeed his decision to write memoirs, gave the quality of himself and his associates. The book makes admirable but astonishing reading. Therein he takes the great work the council was doing for granted as a little child takes God. It is as if he had no sense of it at all. He tells amusing trivialities about his cousin Wilhelm, and his secretary Fearman. He pokes fun at the American president, who was, indeed, rather a little accident of the political machine than a representative American. And he gives a long description of how he was lost for three days in the mountains, in the company of the only Japanese member, a loss that seems to have caused no serious interruption of the work of the council. The Brasago Conference has been written about time after time, as though it were a gathering of the very flower of humanity. Perched up there by the freak or wisdom of Leblanc, it had a certain Olympian quality. 
and the natural tendency of the human mind to elaborate such a resemblance would have give us its members the likenesses of gods it would be equally reasonable to compare it to one of those enforced meetings upon the mountain tops that must have occurred in the opening phases of the deluge the strength of the council lay not in itself but in the circumstances that had quickened its intelligence dispelled its vanities and emancipated it from traditional ambitions and antagonisms it was stripped of the accumulation of centuries a naked government with all that freedom of action that nakedness affords and its problems were set before it with a plainness that was out of all comparison with the complicated and perplexing intimations of the former time section three the world on which the council looked did indeed present a task quite sufficiently immense and altogether too urgent for any wanton indulgence in internal dissension it may be interesting to sketch in a few phrases the condition of mankind at the close of the period of warring states in the year of crisis that followed the release of atomic power it was a world extraordinarily limited when one measures it by later standards and it was now in a state of the direst confusion and distress it must be remembered that at this time men had still to spread into enormous areas of the land surface of the globe there were vast mountain wildernesses forest wildernesses sandy deserts and foreign lands men still clung closely to water and arable soil in temperate or subtropic climates they lived abundantly only in river valleys and all their great cities had grown upon large navigable rivers or close to ports upon the sea over great areas even of this suitable land flies and mosquitoes armed with infection had so far defeated human invasion and under their protection the virgin forests remained untouched indeed the whole world even in its most crowded districts was filthy with flies and swarming with needless insect life to an extent which is now almost incredible a population map of the world in nineteen fifty would have followed seashore and river courses so closely in its darker shading as to give an impression that homo sapiens was an amphibious animal his roads and railways lay also along the lower contours only here and there to pierce some mountain barrier or reach some holiday resort did they clamber above three thousand feet and across the ocean his traffic passed in definite lines there were hundreds of thousands of square miles of ocean no ship ever traversed except by mischance into the mysteries of the solid globe under his feet he had not yet pierced for five miles and it was still not forty years since with a tragic pertinacity he had climbed to the poles of the earth the limitless mineral wealth of the arctic and antarctic circles was still buried beneath vast accumulations of immemorial ice and the secret riches of the inner zones of the crust were untapped and indeed unsuspected the higher mountain regions were known only to a sprinkling of guide-led climbers and the frequenters of a few gaunt hotels and the vast rainless belts of land that lay across continental masses from gobi to sahara and along the backbone of america with their perfect air their daily baths of blazing sunshine their nights of cool serenity and glowing stars and their reservoirs of deep-lying water were as yet only desolations of fear and death to the common imagination and now under the shock of the atomic bombs the great masses of population which had gathered into the enormous dingy town centers of that period were dispossessed and scattered disastrously over the surrounding rural areas it was as if some brutal force grown impatient at last at man's blindness 
had with the deliberate intention of a rearrangement of population upon more wholesome lines shaken the world the great industrial regions and the large cities that had escaped the bombs were because of their complete economic collapse in almost as tragic a plight as those that blazed and the countryside was disordered by a multitude of wandering and lawless strangers in some parts of the world famine raged in many regions there was plague the plains of north india which had become more and more dependent for the general welfare on the railways and that great system of irrigation canals which the malignant section of the patriots had destroyed were in a state of peculiar distress whole villages lay dead together no man heeding and the very tigers and panthers that preyed upon the emaciated survivors crawled back infected into the jungle to perish large areas of china were a prey to brigand bands it is a remarkable thing that no complete contemporary account of the explosion of the atomic bombs survives there are of course innumerable allusions and partial records and it is from these that subsequent ages must pierce together the image of these devastations the phenomena it must be remembered changed greatly from day to day and even from hour to hour as the exploding bomb shifted its position threw off fragments or came into contact with water or a fresh texture of soil Barnet, who came within forty miles of Paris early in October, is concerned chiefly with his account of the social confusion of the countryside and the problems of his command, but he speaks of heaped cloud masses of steam all along the sky to the southwest, and of a red glare beneath these at night. Parts of Paris were still burning and numbers of people were camped in the fields even at this distance, watching over treasured heaps of salvaged loot. He speaks, too, of the distant rumbling of the explosion, like trains going over iron bridges. The other descriptions agree with this. They all speak of the continuous reverberations, or of the thuttering and hammering, or some such phrase and they all testified to a huge pall of steam from which rain would fall suddenly in torrents and amidst which lightning played dawning nearer to paris an observer would have found the salvage camps increasing in number and blocking up the villages and large numbers of people often starving and ailing camping under improvised tents because there was no place for them to go the sky became more and more densely overcast until at last it blotted out the light of day and left nothing but a dull red glare extraordinarily depressing to the spirit in this dull glare great numbers of people were still living clinging to their houses and in many cases subsisting in a state of partial famine upon the produce in their gardens and the stores in the shops of the provision dealers coming in still closer the investigator would have reached the police cordon which was trying to check the desperate enterprise of those who would return to their homes or rescue their more valuable possessions within the zone of imminent danger that zone was rather arbitrarily defined if our spectator could have gotten permission to enter it, he would have entered also a zone of uproar, a zone of perpetual thunderings, lit by a strange purplish-red light, and quivering and swaying with the incessant explosion of the radioactive substance. Whole blocks of buildings were alight and burning fiercely, the trembling, ragged flames looking pale and ghastly, and attenuated in comparison with the full-bodied crimson glare beyond the shells of other edifices already burnt rows pierced by rows of window sockets against the red-lit mist every step farther 
would have been as dangerous as a descent within the crater of an active volcano. These spinning, boiling bomb centers would shift or break unexpectedly into new regions, new fragments of earth or drain or masonry, sudden caught by a jet of disruptive force, might come flying by the explorer's head, or the ground yawn a fiery grave beneath his feet. Few who had ventured into these areas of destruction and survived attempted any repetition of their experiences. There are stories of puffs of luminous, radioactive vapor drifting sometimes scores of miles from the bomb center and killing and scorching all they overtook. At first the conflagrations from the Paris center spread westward halfway to the sea. Moreover, the air in this infernal inner circle of red-lit ruins had a peculiar dryness and a blistering quality, so that it set up a soreness of the skin and lungs that was very difficult to heal. Such was the last state of Paris, and such on a larger scale was the condition of affairs in Chicago, and the same fate had overtaken Berlin, Moscow, Tokyo, the eastern half of London, Toulon, Kiel, and two hundred and eighteen other centers of population or armament. Each was a flaming center of radiant destruction that only time could quench, that indeed in many instances time has still to quench. To this day, though indeed with a constantly diminishing uproar and vigor, these explosions continue. In the map of nearly every country of the world, three or four or more red circles, a score of miles in diameter, mark the position of the dying atomic bombs and the death areas that men have been forced to abandon around them. Within these are perished museums, cathedrals, palaces, libraries, galleries of masterpieces, and a vast accumulation of human achievement, whose charred remains lie buried, a legacy of curious material that only future generations may hope to examine. Section 4 The state of mind of the dispossessed urban population which swarmed and perished so abundantly over the countryside during the dark days of the autumnal months that followed the last war was one of blank despair. Barnet gives sketch after sketch of groups of these people, cramped among the vineyards of Champagne, as he saw them during his period of service with the army of pacification. There was, for example, that man-milliner who came out from a field beside the road that rises up eastward out of Epernay and asked how things were going in Paris. He was, says Barnet, a round-faced man, dressed very neatly in black, so neatly that it was amazing to discover he was living close at hand in a tent made of carpets, and he had an urbane but insistent manner, a carefully trimmed mustache and beard, expressive eyebrows, and hair very neatly brushed. No one goes into Paris, said Barnet. But, monsieur, that is very unenterprising the man by the wayside submitted. The danger is too great. The radiations eat into people's skins. The eyebrows protested. But is nothing to be done? Nothing can be done. But, monsieur, it is extraordinarily inconvenient, this living in exile and waiting. My wife and little boy suffer extremely. There is a lack of amenity and the season advances. I say nothing of the expense and difficulty in obtaining provisions. When does Monsieur think that something will be done to render Paris possible? Barnet considered his interlocutor. I'm told, said Barnet, that Paris is not likely to be possible again for several generations. Oh, but this is preposterous. Consider, monsieur, what are people like ourselves to do in the meanwhile? 
I am a costumer. All my connections and interests, above all my style, demand Paris. Barnet considered the sky, from which a light rain was beginning to fall, the wide fields about them from which the harvest had been taken, the trim poplars by the wayside. Naturally, he agreed, you want to go to Paris, but Paris is over. Over! Finished. But then, monsieur, what is to become of me? Barnet turned his face westward, whither the white road led. Where else, for example, may I hope to find opportunity? Barnet made no reply. Perhaps on the Riviera, or at some such place as Hamburg, or some plague perhaps. All that, said Barnet, accepting for the first time facts that had lain evident in his mind for weeks, all that must be over, too. There was a pause. Then the voice beside him broke out. But, monsieur, it is impossible. It leaves nothing. No, not very much. One cannot suddenly begin to grow potatoes. It would be good if monsieur could bring himself to the life of a peasant and my wife. You do not know the distinguished delicacy of my wife. A refined helplessness, a peculiar dependent charm, like some slender tropical creeper, with great white flowers. But all this is foolish talk. It is impossible that Paris, which has survived so many misfortunes, should not presently revive. I do not think it will ever revive. Paris is finished. London, too, I am told. Berlin. All the great capitals were stricken. But Monsieur must permit me to differ. It is so. It is impossible. Civilizations do not end in this manner. Mankind will insist. On Paris? On Paris. Monsieur, you might as well hope to go down the maelstrom and resume business there. I am content, Monsieur, with my own faith. The winter comes on. Would not Monsieur be wiser to seek a house? Farther from Paris? No, Monsieur. But it is not possible, Monsieur, what you say, and you are under a tremendous mistake. Indeed you are in error. I ask merely for information. When I last saw him, said Barnet, he was standing under the signpost at the crest of the hill gazing wistfully, yet it seemed to me a little doubtfully, now towards Paris, and altogether heedless of a drizzling rain that was wetting him through and through. Section 5 This effect of chill dismay, of a doom as yet imperfectly apprehended, deepens as Barnet's record passes on to tell of the approach of winter, it was too much for the great mass of those unwilling and incompetent nomads to realize that an age had ended, that the old help and guidance existed no longer, that times would not mend again, however patiently they held out. They were still in many cases looking to Paris when the first snowflakes of that pitiless January came swirling about them. The story grows grimmer. If it is less monstrously tragic after Barnet's return to England, it is, if anything, harder. England was a spectacle of fear-embittered householders hiding food, crushing out robbery, driving the starving wanderers from every faltering place upon the roads, lest they should die inconveniently and reproachfully on the doorsteps of those who had failed to urge them onward. The remnants of the British troops left France finally in March, after urgent representations from the provisional government at Orleans thought they could be supported no longer. They seem to have been a fairly well-behaved but highly parasitic force throughout, 
though barnet is clearly of opinion that they did much to suppress sporadic brigandage and maintain social order he came home to a famine-stricken country and his picture of the england of that spring is one of miserable patience and desperate expedients the country was suffering much more than france because of the cessation of the overseas supplies on which it had hitherto relied his troops were given bread dried fish and boiled nettles at dover and marched inland to ashford and paid off on the way thither they saw four men hanging from the telegraph posts by the roadside who had been hung for stealing swedes the labor refuges of kent he discovered were feeding their crowds of casual wanderers on bread into which clay and sawdust had been mixed in surrey there was a shortage of even such fare as that he himself struck across country to winchester fearing to approach the bomb poison district round london and at winchester he had the luck to be taken on as one of the wireless assistants at the central station and given regular rations the station stood in a commanding position on the chalk hill that overlooks the town from the east thence he must have assisted in the transmission of the endless cipher messages that preceded the gathering at Brissago, and there it was that the Brissago proclamation of the end of the war and the establishment of a world government came under his hands. He was feeling ill and apathetic that day, and he did not realize what it was he was transcribing. He did it mechanically, as a part of his tedious duty. Afterwards, there came a rush of messages arising out of the declaration that strained him very much, and in the evening when he was relieved, he ate his scanty supper and then went out upon the little balcony before the station to smoke and rest his brains after this sudden and yet inexplicable press of duty. It was a very beautiful, still evening. He fell talking to a fellow operator, and for the first time, he declares, I began to understand what it was all about. I began to see just what enormous issues had been under my hands for the past four hours. But I became incredulous after my first stimulation. This is some sort of bunkum, I said very sagely. My colleague was more hopeful. It means an end to bomb-throwing and destruction, he said. It means that presently corn will come from America. Who is going to send corn when there is no more value in money? I asked. Suddenly we were startled by a clashing from the town below. The cathedral bells, which had been silent ever since I had come into the district, were beginning, with a sort of rheumatic difficulty, to ring. Presently they warmed a little to the work, and we realized what was going on. They were ringing a peal. We listened with an unbelieving astonishment, and looking into each other's yellow faces. They mean it, said my colleague. But what can they do now? I asked. Everything is broken down. And on that sentence, with an unexpected artistry, Barnet abruptly ends his story. Section 6 From the first, the new government handled affairs with a certain greatness of spirit. Indeed, it was inevitable that they should act greatly. From the first, they had to see the round globe as one problem. It was impossible any longer to deal with it piece by piece. They had to secure it universally from any fresh outbreak of atomic destruction, and they had to ensure a permanent and universal pacification. On this capacity to grasp and wield the whole round globe, their existence depended. There was no scope for any further performance. So soon as the seizure of the existing supplies of atomic ammunition 
and the apparatus for synthesizing carolinum was assured, the disbanding or social utilization of the various masses of troops still under arms had to be arranged, the salvation of the year's harvests, and the feeding, housing, and employment of the drifting millions of homeless people. In Canada, in South America, and Asiatic Russia, there were vast accumulations of provision that was immovable only because of the breakdown of the monetary and credit systems. These had to be brought into the famine districts very speedily if entire depopulation was to be avoided, and their transportation and the revival of communications generally absorbed a certain proportion of the soldiery and more able unemployed. The task of housing assumed gigantic dimensions, and from building camps, the housing committee of the council speedily passed to constructions of a more permanent type they found far less friction than might have been expected in turning the loose population on their hands to these things. People were extraordinarily tamed by that year of suffering and death. They were disillusioned of their traditions, bereft of once obstinate prejudices. They felt foreign in a strange world, and ready to follow any confident leadership. The orders of the new government came with the best of all credentials, rations. The people everywhere were easy to control. One of the old labor experts who had survived until the new time witnesses, as gangs of emigrant workers in a new land. And now it was that the social possibilities of the atomic energy began to appear. The new machinery that had come into existence before the last wars increased and multiplied, and the council found itself not only with millions of hands at its disposal, but with power and apparatus that made its first conceptions of the work it had to do seem pitifully timid. The camps that were planned in iron and deal were built in stone and brass. The roads that were to have been mere iron tracks became spacious ways that insisted upon architecture. The cultivations of foodstuffs that were to have supplied emergency rations were presently, with synthesizers, fertilizers, actinic light, and scientific direction, in excess of every human need. The government had begun with the idea of temporarily reconstituting the social and economic system that had prevailed before the first coming of the atomic engine, because it was to this system that the ideas and habits of the great mass of the world's dispossessed population was adapted. Subsequent rearrangement it had hoped to leave to its successors, whoever they might be. But this, it became more and more manifest, was absolutely impossible. As well might the council have proposed a revival of slavery. The capitalist system had already been smashed beyond repair by the onset of limitless gold and energy. It fell to pieces at the first endeavor to stand it up again. Already before the war, half of the industrial class had been out of work. The attempt to put them back into wages employment on the old lines was futile from the onset. The absolute shattering of the currency system alone would have been sufficient to prevent that, and it was necessary, therefore, to take over the housing, feeding, and clothing of this worldwide multitude without exacting any return in labor whatever. In a little while, the mere absence of occupation for so great a multitude of people everywhere became an evident social danger, and the government was obliged to resort to such devices as simple decorative work in wood and stone, the manufacture of hand-woven textiles, fruit growing, flower growing, and landscape gardening on a grand scale to keep the less adaptable out of mischief, and of paying wages to the younger adults for attendance at school that would equip them to use the new atomic machinery. So quite insensibly, the council drifted into a complete reorganization of urban and industrial life, 
and indeed of the entire social system. Ideas that are unhampered by political intrigue or financial considerations have a sweeping way with them, and before a year was out, the records of the council show clearly that it was rising to its enormous opportunity, and partly through its own direct control, and partly through a series of specific committees. It was planning a new common social order for the entire population of the earth. There can be no real social stability or any general human happiness while large areas of the world and large classes of people are in a phase of civilization different from the prevailing mass. It is impossible now to have great blocks of population misunderstanding the generally accepted social purpose or at an economic disadvantage to the rest. So the council expressed its conception of the problem it had to solve. The peasant, the field worker, and all barbaric cultivators were at an economic disadvantage to the more mobile and educated classes, and the logic of the situation compelled the council to take up systematically the supersession of this stratum by a more efficient organization of production. It developed a scheme for the progressive establishment throughout the world of the modern system in agriculture, a system that should give the full advantages of a civilized life to every agricultural worker. And this replacement has been going on right up to the present day. The central idea of the modern system is a substitution of cultivating guilds for the individual cultivator and for cottage and village life altogether. These guilds are associations of men and women who take over areas of arable or pasture land and make themselves responsible for a certain average produce. They are bodies small enough as a rule to be run on a strictly democratic basis and large enough to supply all the labor except for a certain assistance from townspeople during the harvest needed upon the land farm. They have watchers, bungalows, or chalets on the ground cultivated, but the ease and costlessness of modern locomotion enables them to maintain a group of residences in the nearest town with a common dining room and clubhouse, and usually also a guild house in the national or provincial capital. Already this system has abolished a distinctively rustic population throughout vast areas of the old world, where it has prevailed immemorially, that shy, unstimulated life of the lonely hovel, the narrow scandals and petty spies and persecutions of the small village, that hoarding, half-inanimate existence away from books, thought, or social participation, and in constant contact with cattle, pigs, poultry, and their excrement, is passing away out of human experience. In a little while, it will be gone altogether. In the 19th century, it had already ceased to be a necessary human state, and only the absence of any collective intelligence, and an imagined need for tough and unintelligent soldiers, and for a prolific class at a low level, prevented its systematic replacement at that time. And while this settlement of the country was in progress, the urban camps of the first phase of the council's activities were rapidly developing, partly through the inherent forces of the situation, and partly through the council's direction, into a modern type of town. Section 7. It is characteristic of the manner in which large enterprises forced themselves upon the Brissago Council that it was not until the end of the first year of their administration, and then only with extreme reluctance, that they would take up the manifest need for a lingua franca for the world. They seem to have given little attention to the various theoretical universal languages which were proposed to them. 
they wish to give as little trouble to hasty and simple people as possible and the world-wide elstribution of english gave them a bias for it from the beginning the extreme simplicity of its grammar was also in its favor it was not without some sacrifices that the english-speaking peoples were permitted the satisfaction of hearing their speech used universally the language was shorn of a number of grammatical peculiarities the distinctive forms for the subjunctive mood for example and most of its irregular plurals were abolished its spelling was systematized and adopted to the vowel sounds in use upon the continent of europe and a process of incorporating foreign nouns and verbs commenced that speedily reached enormous proportions within ten years from the establishment of the world republic the new english dictionary had swelled to include a vocabulary of two hundred and fifty thousand words and a man of nineteen hundred would have found considerable difficulty in reading an ordinary newspaper on the other hand the men of the new time could still appreciate the older english literature certain minor acts of uniformity accompanied this larger one the idea of a common understanding and a general simplification of intercourse once it was accepted led very naturally to the universal establishment of the metric system of weights and measures and to the disappearance of the various makeshift calendars that had hitherto confused chronology the year was divided into thirteen months of four weeks each and new year's day and leap year's day were made holidays and did not count at all in the ordinary week so the weeks and months were brought into correspondence and moreover as the king put it to fearman it was decided to nail down easter in these matters as in so many matters the new civilization came as a simplification of ancient complications the history of the calendar throughout the world is a history of inadequate adjustments of attempts to fix seed time and midwinter that go back into the very beginning of human society and this final rectification had a symbolic value quite beyond its practical convenience but the council would have no rash nor harsh innovations no strange names for the months and no alteration in the numbering of the years the world had already been put upon one universal monetary basis for some months after the accession of the council the world's affairs had been carried on without any sound currency at all over great regions money was still in use but with the most extravagant variations in price and the most disconcerting fluctuations of public confidence the ancient rarity of gold upon which the entire system rested was gone gold was now a waste product in the release of atomic energy and it was plain that no metal could be the basis of the monetary system again henceforth all coins must be token coins yet the whole world was accustomed to metallic money and a vast proportion of existing human relationships had grown upon a cash basis and were almost inconceivable without that convenient liquidating factor it seemed absolutely necessary to the life of the social organization to have some sort of currency and the council had therefore to discover some real value upon which to rest it various such apparently stable values as land and hours of work were considered ultimately the government which was now in possession of most of the supplies of energy releasing material fixed a certain number of units of energy as the value of a gold sovereign declared a sovereign to be worth exactly twenty marks twenty-five francs five dollars and so forth with the other current units of the world and undertook under various qualifications and conditions to deliver energy upon demand as payment for every sovereign presented on the whole 
This worked satisfactorily. They saved the face of the pound sterling. Coin was rehabilitated, and after a phase of price fluctuations, began to settle down to definite equivalents and uses again, with names and everyday values familiar to the common run of people. Section 8. As the Brasago Council came to realize that what it had supposed to be temporary camps of refugees were rapidly developing into great towns of a new type, and that it was remolding the world in spite of itself, it decided to place this work of redistributing the non-agricultural population in the hands of a compactor and better qualified special committee. That committee is now far more than the council of any other of its delegated committees, the active government of the world. Developed from an almost invisible germ of town planning that came obscurely into existence in Europe or America, the question is still in dispute, somewhere in the closing decades of the 19th century, its work, the continual active planning and replanning of the world, as a place of human habitation, is now, so to speak, the collaborative material activity of the race, the spontaneous, disorderly spreadings and recessions of populations, as aimless and mechanical as the trickling of split water, which was the substance of history for endless years, giving rise to congestions, here to chronic devastating wars, and everywhere to a discomfort and disorderliness that was at its best only picturesque is at an end men spread now with the whole power of the race to aid them into every available region of the earth their cities are no longer tethered to running water and the proximity of cultivation their plans are no longer affected by strategic considerations or thoughts of social insecurity the aeroplane and the nearly costless mobile car have abolished trade routes. A common language and a universal law have abolished a thousand restraining inconveniences, and so an astonishing dispersal of habitations has begun. One may live anywhere, and so it is that our cities are now true social gatherings, each with a character of its own and distinctive interests of its own, and most of them with a common occupation. They lie out in the former deserts, these long-wasted sun-baths of the race. They tower amidst eternal snows. They hide in remote islands and bask on broad lagoons. For a time, the whole tendency of mankind was to desert the river valleys in which the race had been cradled for half a million years. But now that the war against flies had been waged so successfully that this pestilential branch of life is nearly extinct, they're returning thither with a renewed appetite for gardens laced by watercourses, for pleasant living amidst islands and houseboats and bridges, and for nocturnal lanterns reflected by the sea. Man who is ceasing to be an agricultural animal becomes more and more a builder, a traveler, and a maker. How much he ceases to be a cultivator of the soil, the returns of the redistribution committee showed. Every year the work of our scientific laboratories increases the productivity and simplifies the labor of those who work upon the soil, and the food now of the whole world is produced by less than one percent of its population, a percentage which still tends to decrease. Far few people are needed upon the land than training and proclivity disposed towards it, and as a consequence of this excess of human attention, the garden side of life, the creation of groves and lawns and vast regions of beautiful flowers, has expanded enormously and continues to expand. For, as agricultural method intensifies and the quota is raised, one farm association after another, availing itself of the 1975 regulations, elects to produce a public garden and a plaisance in the place of its former fields and the area of freedom and beauty is increased, and the chemist's triumphs of synthesis, 
which could now give us an entirely artificial food, remain largely in abeyance, because it is so much more pleasant and interesting to eat natural produce and to grow such things upon the soil. Each year adds to the variety of our fruits and the delightfulness of our flowers. 